There's a good start. I think we're ready to get started here then. The recording has uh, begun. My name is Jim Suderman, and I'm delighted to have this opportunity to share with you some of the uh, research that's being conducted in the context of the Interpares Trust AI research project out of the, the University of British Columbia. Uh, I am uh, retired now. I was a longtime archivist and record keeper in the public sector here in Canada, most recently at the City of Toronto. Uh, Kisa, did you want to introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. My name is Kisa, and I am also also supporting Interparish Trust AI. I'm the graduate research assistant there. And currently I'm also working as a um, learning services librarian at the Okanagan College. And I'm delighted to be here. All right, did you want to advance the slide to the next one? Perfect. So our presentation today starts with a story about dummies. Uh, it's, it's something that we all want, right? Well all don't want. None of us want to die in a car crash. So if we look at our history a little bit, we see that in 1886, Carl Benz developed the first gas-powered vehicle. Two years later, his wife and two sons went on a 180-kilometer road trip, taking the gas-powered vehicle out into the wild. Now, the next row is not a typo. It was actually almost 20 years before that that Mary Ward, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, was the first person to die as a result of riding in a steam powered carriage at, at that point. So those are some key starting dates. Then we jump to 1949. The first crash test dummy is developed, Sierra Sam. And in 2012, the first female crash test dummy, Everid, is developed. The point is that the time that elapsed between the development of the car and that of a key safety device was 63 years and then another 63 years to develop the first female crash test dummy. So with that sort of uh, uh, stream running under our presentation, we, uh, I'm gonna turn it back to Kisa. Thanks, Jim. So uh, I want to start the presentation uh, with the, some findings from the literature review that we are conducting for our study. So this diagram here captures some of our current work in the systematic review of the privacy literature, which we limited to those studies at the intersection of privacy, archive slash record keeping and AI, which yielded numerous studies with various approaches. So I won't even attempt to cover everything that appears in this Venn diagram. The three main themes that emerge in this th three fields are legal compliance, risk assessment and security. The funny thing is though, their definition or approach to these themes differed based on the discipline. So this may be because the terms are very polysemous. Uh, in fact, the central theme of our research, privacy, is polysemous. Um, there is a big difference between the legal definition of privacy and the ethical definition of privacy. So what is private for many is context-driven. For instance, you would feel fine sharing your medical history with a medical professional, but not with your potential employer. It is private information in one context and not in another. Moreover, every culture may have a different sense of private information. So in Korean culture, which is the culture that I'm from, um, one of the first things that one asks when meeting another person is asking their age, because they need to know uh, what term they need to refer you to. But we know that in uh, North America and in Europe, that would be considered private information and considered very rude. So, but even disregarding all these cultural or personal differences, um, privacy is defined differently even within the legal jurisdiction. So each jurisdiction has different privacy-related legislation. So FIPA in uh, British Columbia, for example, or GDPR in Europe, and they all have different approaches to privacy. Likewise, risk assessment and security are themes that have different meanings. You might notice that privacy risk assessment is only on the privacy side of this Venn diagram, and cybersecurity is in the area where privacy and AI overlap. In literature that discuss both privacy and AI, risk management is often discussed in the context of cybersecurity, where the environment private information is stored, is protected. This is, of course, important 
and it required to protect private information, but it is not the way to protect actual private information. And of course, none of them mentioned the archival risk, and <laughs> so they don't appear in any of the intersection between AI and privacy, just as a risk. Um, so these are some of the findings that will underpin rest of the discussion on the literature. So one of the biggest issues in protecting privacy is identifying information that needs to be protected. As we all know, records are being created in unprecedented volume and speed, which humans cannot keep up with. It becomes extremely difficult for any institution to release information, and it is especially true for public bodies that are subject to freedom of information requests. So how can we deal with this? On top of the records managers, um, there is another group of people who also need to identify information in the midst of increasingly growing records, lawyers. To discover electronically stored information, they use a process called e-discovery, which is short for electronic discovery. E-discovery is one of the threats that we are currently exploring for this reason. Now, I am not a lawyer, so please excuse my oversimplification of the process, but I will give you a short overview of e-discovery. So e-discovery, to put it very simply, is discovery of electronically stored information in legal proceedings, which includes, but is not limited to, litigation or FOI requests. It has nine stages, information governance, identification, preservation, collection, processing, review, analysis, production, and presentation. Out of these stages, the most costly stage is actually the review stage. The review stage is when people have to review electronically stored information for relevance and attorney client privilege so that they know what information needs to be withheld. This is where technology assisted review comes in. Um, technology assisted review is in quote, a process of having computer software electronically classify documents based on input from expert reviewers in an effort to expedite the organization and prioritization of document collection, end quote. So essentially it helps to identify whether the information can be released or not. And this is a great step towards privacy protection. We can use technology assisted review to classify and review documents to protect privacy in much reasonable time frame. It can review more documents than human can. It can identify personally identifying information in records much faster than human can. Therefore, we'll be able to release the information quickly without compromising transparency and we can protect records more easily. Sounds great, right? But there are some issues I discovered throughout my literature review process that I would like to highlight. So once technology assisted review finishes identifying the records, how do we actually protect privacy? The identification does not equal protection. Do we not release the entire record set or do we just cover things up? As I was um, reading literature on a discovery and technology assisted review, I noticed that my search constantly led toward anonymization and pseudonymization. This is likely because the actual protection of personal information after the discovery requires something to be done to the information. For instance, this article by Garrett and Wonsever titled Automatic Curation of the Court Record um, is one of the many studies I read about this process. To put it very, very simply, it identifies the personal information and attempts to apply consistent pseudonym to the recognized personally identifying information in the court document. According to Hantonen's 2017 article titled, Privacy as an Archival Problem and a Solution, there are five mechanisms to protect privacy. Purpose limitation, privacy self-management, which is represented by the right to be forgotten uh, for the most part, destruction, anonymization, and information safe haven approach. In the past, the information safe haven approach was one of the most prominent ways to protect privacy and control access to sensitive information, you know, confidential information withheld by secret agents and whatnot. This may actually also be the best approach for archival purposes as it allows for contextual transfer without compromising any information. However, it is not really feasible because we need to release records and information for various purposes, for government transparency, litigation, you name it. And of course, destruction is obviously not possible and that's not the path that we should really head to with government documentations at least. 
Purpose limitation and privacy self-management methods are increasingly guaranteed through privacy legislation, but there is an issue with that too. So I will come back to that a bit later. Um, but so perhaps based on this very brief discussion, anonymization is the best approach at this point. But if we anonymize the personally identifying information, is that protecting the information and the people? Are they free from the risk? Unfortunately, the answer is no. A person can still be identified through a mosaic effect. This means through publicly available information outside of the information that is anonymized or through auxiliary information, a person can be re-identified. For example, if this presentation or the record about this presentation was made available and my name was anonymized, but Jim's name wasn't and the presentation title wasn't, then anyone can go to the website and find the information and they can identify that person was me. And if all personally identifiable information in record set is truly anonymized, de-identified, encrypted, so there is no way back, how do we then prove the archival bond, especially if it's done automatically? There is a risk to archival integrity, which does not get talked about very often. And by that, I mean never in legal and computer science literature. Some studies that look at pseudonymization recognize this and attempt to address this issue. So I will note that they are not, still not talking, still thinking about archives, but still they're kind of going in that direction. So for instance, the study that I just mentioned earlier, anonymization of court, German court records, used named entity recognizers to apply same pseudonym for single entity throughout the document, protecting the privacy of individuals and making the anonymized records coherent. Now, this may be a fairly straightforward process for known personally identifying information, such as social security numbers, names, addresses, and et cetera. However, so many of personal or sensitive information depends on the context. What is sensitive to one person may not be to another. Remember how I talked about the policeman's nature of privacy? This is exactly where that comes in. Sensitive information just does not just include personally identifying information. And given that our artificial intelligence are reliant on their training data, which Jim will talk a bit more about after, and replicate the biases in the data, how do we then train privacy solutions that don't retrench the historical violations of privacy rights of marginalized groups within society? How do we respect a different definition of privacy? Suppose we follow a rule-based privacy protection in which purpose limitation and privacy self-management are guaranteed and train AI based on that grounds. In that case, we may only be protecting one type of privacy and it is not an ethical one. So my question is, can we reach ethical privacy that protect all sensitive information? It's like lions. <laughs> I know. These challenges cannot be really solved within disciplinary silo. They require compliance, risk awareness, technology development, and archival expertise. So our research so far has shown that despite abundant scholarship on this problem, we are still very much in the beginning stages of developing AI privacy solutions for archives and records. Yet, many places are already implementing or planning to implement these newly developed solutions to their records and data, hence driving with, without sit belts or without crush, test, crush testing dummies. Thanks, Keeson. I'll, I'll uh, take it from here. So Keeson, uh, Keeson's work at, in the literature review has taken a 30,000 feet kind of perspective. Uh, the presentation, that the, the part of the presentation that I'll be delivering is focused on, uh, I'm now a guy that's got some records I don't know too much about, but I have all the responsibilities of protecting privacy connected with it. So, so adjust your, your parameters a little bit there. And uh, this introductory slide might help you do that. Here are a couple of pictures, a couple of images from AI art generators regarding privacy protection. While I don't wanna to read too much into them, it does strike me that they illustrate the wildly varying ideas about privacy protection that exist among us humans today and that Keeson has been doing some uh, outlining, has outlined for us. So why does privacy protection even matter? We have to say this one. Well, there's the law, of course. 
Uh, according to the UN, no less than 137 countries have some form of privacy protection law on the books. And Keith has already gone over the point that it's an ethical priority, not just for the library and the archives communities, but also for the AI community where principles take the shape of subject control over use of data, consent, uh, design, uh, sorry, privacy by design, rights to rectification, erasure and processing restrictions and recommendations for improved data protection laws. As with most things involving computers, it all starts with the data. If our inputs are garbage, then we can expect our outputs will be too. So if we want to train an agent to predict where personal information exists and how sensitive it is, then we need data that supports that training. And it's easy to see how things might get quickly complicated. For example, named entity recognition or NER is a well-established approach to identifying individuals and locations. But the entity Denver might be a city or a person. And if a person, it might be male or female. And because privacy protection is so dependent on context, the distinction is vital. Good data is a key to successful AI implementations, whether those are to protect privacy or to exploit it, quite frankly. Um, that said, estimates for the failure of IT projects range up to 97%, sort of a random factoid, less, somewhat less random, 85% of big data or data science uh, projects will fail. And that is due to data problems usually. So it makes sense to consider what kinds of data are identified in the literature that uh, describing privacy protection studies. I should note that I accept the position that machines may be able to do the work better, more accurately, more consistently and faster than, than we can. But for machines to reach that level of effectiveness, we humans need to be clear on what privacy protection is and how to go about it. It's a challenging subject made even more so by emerging concepts like community privacy and rapidly evolving technology, which partly illustrated on the slide here. So with a loose or evolving concept of privacy, we humans have now embarked on training machines to do the work for us. What could go wrong? The good news is that privacy protection in specific sectors, such as health, may be well enough defined to enable a comprehensive list of types of PI, a list that can be shared with our machines regulations that define roles and accountabilities in the health sector may be more clearly set out than is the case in some other sectors. So you can see where I'm going with this. If it is not possible to establish a comprehensive typology of PI, personal information, then how likely are we to succeed in training a machine to assist with providing comprehensive privacy protection? This table represents a small selection of the studies from the lit review that Keeson is, uh, has been uh, conducting. I'll talk a little bit more about the two studies in bold in a minute, but just some overall impressions about what the literature has told me about the data used and the successes achieved is what I wanna share here. One is that research studies into reliable models for predicting the presence of PI are still quite narrowly focused. None of these studies attempted to build a model capable of predicting all types of personal information. Nonetheless, they've achieved some really good results within the specific context of each study. Maybe it doesn't even make, another thought is that maybe it doesn't even make sense to, to work towards a single model or tool for protecting all types of privacy in all sectors. And PI, of course, as Keeson pointed out, is only one of many types of information that may need to be protected. A third thought is that results, even if better than what humans can achieve, are still not going, are still not perfect. So however we proceed, effective integration with human processes will continue to be essential for the foreseeable future. So this is a study about anonymizing Uruguayan court documents. 
Uh, the study applied off the shelf nat natural language processing or NLP tools, including their embedded named entity recognition capabilities. The illustration on the right, if you can see it clearly, uh, will give you a sense of the results from using those tools right out of the box on the court, rec court documents. Because the NER tools were trained on journals and scientific texts, their effectiveness was found to be limited, quite limited when applied to court records. Once they retrained the NER tool, I think it was Spacey, they achieved much, much higher success in recognizing named entities. But nonetheless, the second objective of the study, which was correctly linking the same entities throughout was still less than satisfactory below 50%. Next slide, please. This study, which uses some of the same tools as the previous, uh, focuses on the effectiveness of open source tools that are readily available. It also, for those who might be interested in jumping into this pool, provides thumbnail assessments of the strengths of each. But it is the uh, conclusion, the study's conclusion that I want to draw to your attention, and it's there on the slide. Despite the availability of comprehensive NLP research in the literature, there is insufficient work relating to NER, PII, its implications, and possible use cases. There are links with clinical and, or biomedical data, but not in the broad spectrum of PII, which encompasses many different kinds of personal information. So if we, you're using tools right off the uh, shelf, uh, be aware of their limitations. Let's spend a little bit of time on risks. How am I doing for time? I think we're okay. Uh, let me talk about synthetic data. Synthetic data is information generated by computer simulations or algorithms rather than drawn from real world applications. Synthetic data means no compliance issues and it can be generated at need whatever to whatever requirements are specified. So this is attractive because apparently data scientists spend almost half their time not solving business problems, but rather cleaning and loading data. So synthetic data holds out the possibility of preparing data sets for training machines, given that acquiring data sets with personal information is difficult. So where's the risk? Well, synthetic data needs to reflect the real world where the machine will actually be deployed. If the machine is trained on high quality synthetic data and then deployed to a live environment where data quality is poor, it will not function as expected. There's a reason that Tesla is collecting real world data from its customers. PI label sets. Oh, sorry. Well, let me talk about personal information label sets. These are labels, label sets are, are sets of labels uh, that are used to mark whether this category of information is this type of personal information. So for example, a unique identifying number might be a passport number or a social insurance number, and that would be a label. There are no doubt many proprietary label sets and I haven't seen them. Uh, but I was able to find four publicly available label sets. Uh, but as we noted at the, as noted at the outset, there is no comprehensive typology of personal information. And so it is not reasonable to think that there's ever going to be a, a comprehensive set of PI labels as long as that situation remains. The best that I found was uh, from PII tools which included labels for 16 of 32 types of PI identified. And the 32 types are uh, those listed in the illustration on the right. This is a web page from the BC, British Columbia government. Uh, and you can see uh, a bunch of types of PI there. Some are quite specific, some are very general. And there are, as Keeson pointed out, it's not one size fits all. Different jurisdictions uh, may label or have different types of PI. Um, if one considers the general data protection regulation from the European Union, there would be additional uh, types of uh, personal information. And the Ardia and Kleinfelder article referred to at, at 
when I started, I actually identified 140 types of PI. That's the only uh, article that Keeson has turned up that's attempted to generate a comprehensive typology. Last thing for this slide is some, uh, a few words on security. Uh, this slide mentions three ways in which bad actors may pose a threat to privacy via the training set. So it's not just a threat to privacy, it's how the training set can be utilized at, to attack uh, privacy. I'm pretty sure I'm reporting these three reasonably accurately, but since this area falls so far outside my area of expertise, uh, the article that I drew them from and this lovely diagram um, is, is on the slide for ease of reference. The article also outlines other forms of attack, but also how machine learning can be used to provide greater security for personal information. So the back and forth. Then some concluding comments. I hope we've given you lots to think about, especially with regard to training machines to do some of our work and also making our collections available as data. The volume of digital records is expanding exponentially and sensitive content is pervasive. The solution cannot be just to close everything for a hundred years. And having for overseen privacy protection programs in practice, I agree with privacy scholars like Solov, Ardia and Kleinfelter that the regulatory environment for privacy protection is fragmented and unclear. And some emerging privacy concepts like community privacy have not yet appeared in the literature I've reviewed. Fit for purpose data for privacy protection is hard to find, not only because it's not usually publicly available, in fact, it shouldn't be, uh, but also because suitable bodies of records may not comprehensively reflect all types of personal information. And one who has looked at the Clinton emails or the uh, State Department cables uh, will know that there's lots of personal stuff in there. Uh, it might be hard to categorize. High precision results will likely require time consuming manual labeling. Off the shelf tools may be all some institutions can afford, but if, they, if they're used, care needs to be taken on how those tools are used and for what. From an ethical perspective, a study of ethics in the AI community grouped accountability pr principles into one of three identified phases of the AI life cycle, design, monitoring, and redress. Until recently, I would have said that there is no phase comparable to redress in the archival and library communities. But early this year, and I've seen it in a few other recent publications. Earlier this year, the reconciliation framework developed by the Steering Committee on Canada's Archives advocates remedies, including dismantling colonial aspects of archival policies, practices, and regulation. So that moves into the redress space. And lastly, uh, applying machine learning models to privacy protection may best be applied sector by sector. If so, such an approach might benefit from the priority on function and mandate in archival description. And I'll turn it back to you, Keith, for the last word. Thanks, Jim. So as with cars, we know that there are serious implications for privacy protection already now at the dawn of artificial intelligence or AI. And as Jim said, fit for, fit for purpose training data may be the crushed test dummy for safe AI implementation. If it is, we better not waste 63 years to develop it. So thanks everyone. And if you have any questions, we'd love to answer those. Stop share. Great presentation. I'm just going to jump in and say I don't see any questions in the chat just yet, but a lot of uh, thank yous. Thank you from us too. I see we're at pretty much at the half hour mark. Uh, really hope that we said something you didn't already know and uh, hope we gave you some food for thought.
and hope to talk maybe in another forum with you again.